Hi, I'm Mark Coase. I'm the director of the museum, and welcome to our Monshire Talks, Frankenstein 200. We're really thankful for our sponsor, Ledger Bank, for helping us to bring together some conversations in science and culture. And today we're celebrating the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. Uh, museums and libraries all across the country are taking this up as a point of celebration of thinking about what a great work that of science fiction that has inspired so many other works and so many ideas throughout the last 200 years. Um, from a philosopher's perspective, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein operates on several levels. It's a philosophical exploration of what it means to be human and the nature of moral philosophy and responsibility. It's also the nature of science and scientific knowledge at a pivotal and transitional moment in the history of science and it, the role it explores the role of scientists in society. So contextualizing these philosophical and scientific issues helps us see Frankenstein as a fascinating and provocative exploration of questions about human nature and the human condition, the quest for knowledge, and the nature of moral responsibility. So helping us today on our journey is Dr. Michael Eshoo, a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Vermont. Professor Eshoo teaches courses in the Introduction of Philosophy, Ethics, Medical Ethics, Comp, and the Philosophy of Science. So let's welcome. Hi. Um, so can everyone hear me? Good, sir. It's OK. Um, so I'm going to start um, kind of by disqualifying myself a little bit. I'm not a Frankenstein scholar. I approached Frankenstein through the philosophy of science. I began teaching um, this work about um, eight, ten years ago in my, um, uh, on some honors college classes at the University of Vermont. And I had kind of thought about Frankenstein the way I think a lot of people have through popular culture. Um, and some of the popular representations of the novel and work. And as I read and began to study it more, I realized there's a heck of a lot going on. Um, in fact, there's so much going on, I'm just going to focus on something pretty narrow, a couple of narrow themes that I just wanted to try to share with you. Um, so um, what is Frankenstein really about, and, and how can I offer some, some backdrop? So, I'm going to just try to frame some issues that were going on in the sciences at the time. Um, it's a really rich novel for all of these themes that Mary Shelley is bringing together. Um, I'm not going to try to give a coherent, thorough, overarching interpretation. I'm going to try to frame some background issues and, and hopefully provoke some thought about what might have been going on uh, in the context and maybe how we can start thinking about its relevance um, for today. Um, so, um, the theme I really want to focus on is what does it mean to be human? And I think if we start looking at some of the background philosophical and scientific issues, you can see that Shelley is framing this for us in a novel way. Um, so, uh, I am um, not going to be giving a lot of summary uh, of the novel itself. I'm uh, going to assume that you've read the novel. And I'll, I'll tell you what I tell my students. I don't rely on the films, the movies, the novels, very different. Uh, the book has got a lot of stuff going on that doesn't really come through in the films. Um, so I think one way to approach this is to think about um, the Enlightenment and the development of Enlightenment science. Um, the 1700s saw uh, broad um, applications and developments in the sciences, the scientific method being applied to a variety of different areas, attempts to apply Newton's laws attempts to extend these into chemistry in particular, um, discoveries in electricity and electromagnetic phenomena. Um, I'm going to focus on three things that I think are really important in the, in the novel. This is what we call the vitalism debate, uh, some of the developments in electricity and galvanism, and I'm going to talk a little bit about chemistry. Um, along the way, and I, I should say, some of these photos I forgot to attribute. Uh, which is very bad. We should always attribute references to my photos, so I apologize. I think I got most of them. But as I was looking, some of them are unattributed. Um, but this is just a, a famous picture. Um, it gives you kind of a, a sense of the, the majesty and the promise of, of enlightenment science. Um, so the first thing I want to focus on is the vitalism debate. 
uh, the vitalism debate we kind of um, associate with, or the beginning with uh, Rene Descartes. Um, Descartes was a philosopher who gave us what we now think of as Cartesian dualism. So he argued that the mind and the body are fundamentally different and distinct kinds of things. Descartes was trying to really make a claim for the role of, of the mind of consciousness as not being a part of the body as being something else. But we, he also did a lot of uh, work and experimental work very early on uh, in, in anatomy uh, and had described the body as a mechanical, mechanistic machine. So we associate Descartes with what we call the mechanistic view in the vitalism debate. The vitalism debate is really a debate about what is the nature of, of life. What, is, what does it mean to be a living organism and how can we define life? Um, Descartes is only used as a kind of representative of the, of the mechanistic view because he had basically identified the body as this kind of machine. Um, so we, we think of Descartes as, as kind of representing this kind of mechanistic view. But um, two um, kind of exemplars of this debate, uh, Xavier Bichat uh, was an anatomist who wrote, to create the universe, God endowed matter with electricity, I'm sorry, with gravity, elasticity, affinity, and furthermore, one person received as it shares sensibility and contractibility. Sensibility here is meant it is meant basically for consciousness. Uh, and what, what the vitalist uh, thought is that you couldn't explain the emergence of life without attributing some kind of fundamental source uh, 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 of vital uh, force, um, variously translated. Um, so Bashat represents the, um, the vitalist. On the other side, on the mechanistic side, is uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, Versilius, I have been pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, so Jacob Versilius. Uh, he argued that chemistry could explain all activity of organisms. There is, he said, no special force exclusively the property of living matter, which may be called a vital force. So he basically challenged the vitalist view and said there's nothing special about living matter. It can be explained in terms of, of the mechanisms of, of matter itself. Um, so this need for a, a vital force or a vital fluid, he thought, didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so Mary Shelley, sorry, this is a little behind. Mary Shelley um, and, and her husband Percy Shelley were both very familiar with these debates. Um, there's a really fascinating, lurid um, story about the relationship between Mary and Percy Shelley. Um, I encourage anybody to delve into the background. Percy Shelley was a well-known romantic poet. Um, at the time, not as well-known as he became, um, though he was well-known at the time. Um, had been kicked out of Oxford for his atheism, was known as Mad Shelley, um, was known for his electrical experiments uh, you know, in, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, and he uh, had a room full of, of electrical, uh, at the time, uh, early electrical gizmos. Um, Mary um, and Percy had embarked on this intellectual tour. They had uh, recently been married, and they undertook this kind of an intellectual investigation uh, of a variety of topics, um, not just science, theology, politics, religion. They were both very radical in their views um, and took a very radical view of, of the nature of science, um, and uh, they both um, interacted with many of the leading scientists of the day, discussing some of these issues, um, particularly chemistry and electricity. Um, and uh, there was this famous debate where Percy Shelley's friend and personal physician, William Lawrence, who was a professor of surgery at Royal College of Surgeons, um, uh, uh, had this, this debate with John Abernathy, who was the leading uh, uh, sort of developed the view of vitalists. So Abernathy and Lawrence had this long exchange uh, in print and uh, sometimes in personal and public debates where they debated the various merits of vitalism. Um, Lawrence advocating the materialistic view. Lawrence was also associated with the emerging kind of radical atheism that was developing at the time. Uh, and so um, a lot of people were uh, very hesitant to endorse this view. Um, uh, Percy, in particular, 
advocated for uh, Shelley's view. Uh, connected to vitalism debate was this growing recognition of electrical phenomena in nature, um, various uh, electrical events. Uh, it wasn't understood uh, at the time, for instance, that lightning was, it was thought that it might be electrical. It took Benjamin Franklin some of his experiments to demonstrate that this was so. Uh, at the time, most of the electrical phenomena that would be, although electrical phenomena had been understood for a long time, they, they had been uh, identified, they hadn't been understood, I should say. Um, they were sort of novelty uh, acts. They were things, you know, you could develop a static electrical charges. Uh, you, people could shock themselves with these static electrical charges. Um, in the late 1700s, there was this famous sort of traveling show called The Flying Boy, where a static electrical charge was generated, and you were invited to come touch the boy who was hanging from, from the, um, suspended in a room, and you get a shock. This was important uh, uh, because it, showed that the body could conduct electricity, and that it was a conductor. And, and again, nobody really understood what was going on at the time, only that this could be done, and it wasn't really understood in the late 1700s what to do with this phenomenon, or how to make sense of it. Um, in 1746, the Leyden jar was discovered, or um, uh, it was discovered that you could generate this static electricity and store it in a device which allowed you to discharge it. With the Leyden jar, you were then able to take this thing around and begin to do experiments. Um, Leyden, uh, the Leyden jar, early on wasn't fully understood what, what could be done with it, but as the technology sort of developed, Leyden jars were made more and more powerful, their applications were extended, um, and, and in our purposes, they were extended to biological phenomena. So as, as more and more of the emerging um, scientists I, I say scientist because that term wasn't invented until 1830s. Um, at the time, the, the, the men of science, the men and, and some women who were uh, pursuing the sciences were thought of as natural philosophers. So, um, these natural philosophers began to realize that you could extend the uh, electrical experimentation to biological phenomena, which they, they did. Um, so um, our next sort of... Uh, development in this story after, after vitalism is the application of some of this electrical phenomena to, to biological uh, phenomena. So uh, you can imagine there's a lot of craziness going on as people begin to develop cures for everything uh, with electrical treatments. Um, in the uh, late 1700s, the Leyden jars had been sort of ramped up. Um, you'll see the voltaic pile had been invented in, uh, they were able to generate more electrical currents. Um, people were claiming that electrical shocks and treatments could cure palsy, migraines, variety of things. Um, other experimenters were um, working though to apply some of this technology to um, biological phenomena in a more rigorous way. And Galvani, uh, Luigi Galvani is one of these, an Italian researcher, again, known um, for his very precise, carefully controlled experiments, began to apply the, uh, these um, electrical devices to animals. And he found frog limbs to be particularly useful um, for this. They preserved their charges for several hours after being removed. So in fact, in the late 1700s, there was apparently a shortage of frog legs um, because everybody was cutting them off and, and, uh, and using them in experimentation which led to many, many little frogs in wheelchairs all over. <laughs> and then, right. So um, uh, the application of, of electric occurrence to frog legs was uh, meant to demonstrate that muscle and nerve and tissue were conductive and were reactive to electric occurrence. Uh, and uh, Galvani himself um, called these um, forces animal, uh, animal electricity. Uh, and Galvani thought that the currents inside the uh, frog's legs were actually like the Leyden jar, that they were somehow operating in the same way. So you can see that this sort of dovetails into the vitalism debate. They thought that the amputated legs of frogs somehow contained their own current that was somehow provoked when you applied the current of the Leyden jar. Uh, he, uh, um, was sort of weighing in on the vitalism debate. 
one, in one of his famous experiments, he, he was actually hanging the frog legs on a metal wrought iron fence during a storm, and they all began to twitch, uh, which to him showed that there was some resonance between the, the uh, currents in the, in the atmosphere and these, the currents that he thought would basically be traveling through the frog legs. Uh, this provoked a, a debate with uh, Alejandro Volta, also an Italian experimenter known at the time as the Newton of electricity. Volta was uh, a mechanist, so he thought that electricity was somehow a consequence of interactions of basic materials. Uh, so uh, he and, and Galvani had this extended debate uh, in the late 1700s about the nature of electricity and animal electricity. Uh, Volta claiming that um, there was no need to invoke something like animal electricity, that, that electricity was just some sort of basic phenomenon that they were trying to discover. In trying to explain this, and trying to demonstrate this, he invented uh, the voltaic pile, which is essentially uh, a layering of, of zinc and silver with a, uh, an insulator in between. He stacked a bunch of these together, uh, and he said that the voltaic pile was just a series of, of uh, basically Leyden jars. He called it a battery. Uh, so we kind of, that name sort of stuck, and we saw this idea of a battery. So uh, Volta uh, uh, tried to demonstrate using some of the same ideas that uh, electricity was not some sort of animal um, vital fluid, but instead a, a uh, uh, a natural byproduct of, of material phenomena in the world. Uh, so this, you can see that this kind of dovetails back into the vitalism debate. On the one hand, you have uh, Volta, the mechanist. On the other hand, you have Galvani, who's arguing that there's something uh, essential to animal or biological life that gives it its vital force, this, this animal electricity. Uh, this is from a little later, but uh, you can see that there's this proliferation of medical treatments that are being designed all around electrical current and use of electricity. Uh, so uh, Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, continued with his uncle, uncle's work. Uh, he argued uh, that there was this vital force that could be infused into organisms. He conducted a series of very um, public, very provocative experiments in which he uh, took severed heads and corpses and electrocuted them in public to demonstrate the effects on the body, what would happen to the muscles. Uh, a famous experiment, he took a bull's head uh, in front of a packed lecture hall, uh, hooked it up to a, a voltaic pile, was able to get the tongue to stick out, the eyes to open, contractions of muscles. Uh, so uh, this made quite an impact on the public, as you can imagine. One of the interesting things at the time, and I was going to include some discussion of the development of anatomy, and um, just felt like I needed to keep my discussion kind of short. But in the late 1700s, there was this growing, rapidly growing uh, understanding of the human body, which was being motivated by anatomy by dissection, vivisection. Um, so much so that there was a plague of, of grave robbing. Uh, people were stealing bodies from graves and bringing them to surgeons' offices to, to be dissected so they could understand how the body was working. One of the consequences of this is that they made it a requirement that any criminal, any murderer who was in, in being hanged was a punishment for murder in England at the time, that the uh, criminal be anatomized. Um, Aldini happened to be in London at the time of a famous execution of George Foster and arranged to have his body brought also to a parlor where he was going to conduct uh, experiments on the body. Uh, so uh, that was an extremely, um, uh, I'd say, provocative experiment, raised a lot of um, eyebrows, got some people, that, according to some reports, people ran screaming from the room when they saw the body. Of, uh, of Foster not only contract, but reach out his arm um, as though to ask them to stop. Um, at some points, he looked as though he was going to sit up. His face was contracting. 
uh, Aldini, uh, again, Aldini is a little different than his uncle. He wasn't so invested in the vitalism debate uh, or the nature of this electrical, uh, vital electrical fluid. Uh, he probably was more of a mechanist, but maybe didn't want to tilt his hand to, to identify this with his uncle. Uh, but he began to develop um, more and more um, provocative and perhaps gruesome experiments. Uh, and these were represented in the public. Uh, this is uh, a kind of over-dramatization of Foster. Oh, I'm sorry, this is actually uh, Andrew, uh, Mark Matthew Clydesdale. Um, this is in 1818. It's another uh, uh, experiment that Aldini uh, performed with, uh, with Matthew Clydesdale. Aldini was basically in, in uh, London at the time uh, as a guest of the Royal, uh, Royal Society of Surgeons. And I was kind of making the rounds at all of the salons and public venues for demonstrating the effects of electricity. He was advocating that it be used to resuscitate. That he was hoping that he could find somebody who had drowned. That was his ideal specimen. Um, some reports suggest that he actually was successful at finding a candidate, uh, but his hopes to resuscitate didn't work. Um, and, but he did actually suggest that heart attacks could be prevented or even overcome with the use of a current through the heart. Uh, he wasn't able to perfect this. He didn't understand the nature of currents and how they might have been used. Um, but this is a, another famous event uh, of Matthew Clydesdale, another criminal who had been executed and brought into a salon for experimentation. And according to reports, was able actually leapt off of the table when uh, supplied with the bolt. Uh, so, um, galvanism then became this term that, that basically designated this attempt to revive bodies that had been you know, in various ways killed or had died. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, yeah, even though Aldini wasn't, uh, wasn't his father, they sort of associated the practice with the master. Um, so Aldini would tried to demonstrate uh, the effects of electricity on the body. Um, so galvanism was um, feared. Uh, this is a little later. It's a famous cartoon of a galvanized corpse um, somehow rising from the dead. Um, Galvini did not, I mean, sorry, uh, Aldini did not ever actually try this, but it was the sort of thing that people were afraid was being tried at the time. Uh, one last area uh, of significance in terms of this debate, um, and I'm going to try to you know, connect this to Mary Shelley and Percy, um, is the development of chemistry. This is a huge area in the 1700s. Basically, we have this debate between the flow just on theory of combustion and this newly developed oxygen theory, uh, the former advocated by Joseph Priestley and the latter by Lavoisier. Uh, so we've got the Priestley-Lavoisier debate. Priestley is British, so there's this, this sort of nationalistic tone to this debate. Lavoisier is French. Uh, the, uh, this obviously a lot going on between France and England. There's a huge uh, conflict here over sort of pride of, of discovery. Priestley is uh, beholden to the flow to stand theory. Lavoisier develops a new theory. Actually, Priestley actually apparently coins the term oxygen to give a better account of the nature of combustion. Uh, and uh, although he was uh, still uh, beholden to the, the phlogiston account, phlogiston was this uh, substance that was supposed to account for combustion. Uh, they couldn't get it. You were supposed to weigh material before and after burning, and phlogiston would somehow be accounting for the difference. Um, but but uh, the phlogiston theory wasn't able to account for a lot of combustion and chemical uh, interactions. Slowly, obviously, the oxygen theory began to gain traction. By the turn of the century, the 1800s, it's clear that not only is the oxygen theory the more robust theory, it's going to do a better job of explaining a lot of phenomena, but it's gaining a lot of traction in academia and in the sciences. Uh, what uh, Priestley had also done is isolate various substances using electrical current. Um, so he, uh, he was able to isolate oxygen. He was able to isolate some other chemicals. Uh, 
And he did this through electrical interactions. So uh, the connection between chemical constituents of matter and electrical currents was now beginning to be uh, identified, although it took a long time, obviously, to come up with a good theory of what accounted for these interactions. Um, but the fact that uh, Lavoisier could use an electrical current to isolate some of these chemicals demonstrated that electricity was somehow vital to the interactions of chemicals. Uh, by the turn of the 18th century, the, the oxygen theory uh, had uh, gained full prominence. And here, I think um, Sir Humphrey Davy is, is really important. Mary Shelley knew her. He was a, an advocate and a developer of the um, oxygen theory, chemistry. Uh, and uh, she knew, uh, he knew uh, Mary Shelley's father, who uh, William Goodwin was a very well-known philosopher, uh, moved in all the important intellectual circles. Uh, and she probably even attended some of his lectures at the Royal Institute in 1860. And there's definitely evidence that the character of Waldron in the novel is based off of Davy. Uh, the important thing here is that Davy and uh, kind of developing on the work of uh, Lavoisier uh, had shown that uh, oxygen also uh, was a byproduct of respiration. And now you have this connection between uh, oxygen, respiration, electricity, and vital fluids again, or vital forces. So it looks like electricity is not only a key to biological phenomena, but key to breathing, key to uh, some of these other important biological and chemical interactions that were being identified. So um, Davy is also known at the time as an extremely flamboyant, um, magnanimous, sometimes, sometimes not so magnanimous character uh, who had a big impact, he had a big personality. Uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that he figures uh, pretty, pretty heavily in the novel. So uh, uh, Davy had shown, among other things, that, uh, uh, that chemicals could be isolated using electricity. He had isolated potassium, uh, shown that respiration, and, and uh, shown that respiration and electricity were involved in, in, I'm sorry, respiration and oxygen were involved in blood flow. Um, he also showed that respiration, respiration produced heat, which was also associated with uh, the electrical interactions. Though, again, how all of this fit together wasn't exactly clear at the time. So putting some of these together, you find the themes of vitalism again. Um, was electricity also involved in decomposition of oxygen and respiration? Is electricity this vital force that, that these characters have been seeking or trying to understand? Uh, so all of this is the background, and I think all of it filters through Davy in Mary Shelley's experiences. Uh, she notes in, in some of her notes, this is, by the way, a great addition of uh, Frankenstein, if anybody brand new. Nice introduction by Guillermo del Toro. Nice thing about this is it's really well annotated. And they have some of her notes where she talks about her work investigating Davy, uh, that she had read Davy's chemistry, uh, that she had, she and Percy had also read some of the other material. So I think Davy is clearly this figure that's that through which all of this information is being funneled when uh, when Mary Shelley is writing. Um, and the vitalism debate is in the background. Um, the notion that electricity is somehow connected to this vital fluid uh, is in the background. Uh, Percy Shelley himself was a mechanist, so is she uh, Mary Shelley. They're uh, also uh, atheists, so they're taking a radical view of the nature of human life, that it is essentially mechanical, that it can be reduced to fundamental forces of matter, matter in motion, and somehow yet to be fully understood. Uh, and uh, that, that the sciences are going to somehow reveal the nature of, of human life. Uh, putting all those things together, uh, I think you can see that Shelley's posing some questions about what it means to be human. Now, what I, what I think is interesting about the novel is she's posing some questions that are, uh, I, I think she's maybe not clear on herself what the answers are, how these should be answered. While she's posing certain questions about the nature of human life being a matter of mechanical interactions or somehow fundamental forces of nature, 
she's not quite sure what that means, uh, at least in my interpretation, in my understanding. Uh, but, you know, are we just flesh and bone? Can this flesh and bone be infused with some kind of mechanical force of life? Is that mechanical force of life electricity? Uh, on the other hand, it almost seems as though she's trying to suggest that if that's true, we're looking at some difficult issues that need to be resolved. We, uh, I, I put this up because we associate Frankenstein, uh, at least from the image, with electricity uh, and electrical experimentation. In the novel, it's surprisingly obscure what exactly is going on that animates this creature, the monster. Uh, we don't know. We, we're not invited into the lab. And in fact, there's a lot of indications that electricity isn't involved. Uh, there's no mechanical machinery or equipment in the lab that would have required huge amounts of electricity, something like a lightning bolt, which by the way, time wasn't clear how lightning and electrical phenomena were, interact were interacting, what exactly the relationship was. Although Franklin had demonstrated that lightning was an electrical charge, they couldn't quite understand how it related to the other terrestrial electrical phenomena. So uh, in the novel, it's very unclear what this is. You know, Victor says he's discovered this spark of life. But that's about as much as we get uh, for what the spark of life is. Um, there's all sorts of interesting uh, problems with the kind of story that, that unfolds there. And I think Mary Shelley has left it intentionally un obscure, something for our imagination to sort out. Uh, but it is clear that these debates are functioning in the background, operating in the background, um, laying the stage or laying the framework, so to speak, for us to think about the nature of life, the nature of what it means to be a human being or to be a person. Um, how exactly that is supposed to be resolved or made sense of, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's sort of, for me, the enigma of the novel. Uh, what is Mary Shelley trying to tell us? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm hoping that by framing some of the scientific backdrop against which some of these themes are discussed, though, it will provoke some further thought about what the nature of life and maybe human being is. Thank you. That's great. So I have some questions okay. um, that I, I brought in there. So uh, from a historical perspective, you're talking about reanimation, galvanism, and what it means to be perceived as alive. Uh, but maybe you could frame a little bit about the difference between life and consciousness, yeah. uh, just because it doesn't seem to come up, and the discussion doesn't seem to come up in, in this scientific research. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, well, well, if you think about the development in the novel, I mean, this is one of the things about Frankenstein that I think if you haven't read the book, you're, the most shocking thing is that there's a journey uh, from sort of creation to development. And actually, by the end of the novel, he's read Goethe, he's read philosophy, he's read theology, he's articulate, he's moral. Even though he does horrible things, he seems to understand that there are horrible things and why he does them. My understanding, and I don't know if this is answering the question, or my interpretation of Shelley is she's showing something about what, it, what consciousness actually requires, which is more than physical uh, body. It requires something like not learning, the moral development, social interaction, social understanding. Um, I, I, you know, the the question of whether the in the movie, for instance, this, this issue of, of Frankenstein's mind is, I, I think, terribly confused because uh, he gets this abnormal brain which is inserted into his body. And so now you understand why he's doing all these terrible things. In the book, it's much more sophisticated and complicated. What, what is the nature of the consciousness of, of the monster? He, he seems to me to be, in many ways, much more conscious than Victor. Um, at least much more uh, thoughtful and reflective. Uh, so uh, I don't know if Shelley has uh, some idea about the relationship between mind and body or consciousness and the physical organism that she's trying to work out. I think she's really trying to tell us something about uh, that consciousness requires some sort of education, moral education, socialization, something like that. I don't know if that's 
But it's an interesting way of also framing this idea of maybe breaking down a Cartesian wall of this divide between the body and the mind and thinking about what happened. And how many just to look and show of hands have read the book or read the novel? Okay, I'm going to be in there. So um, the, the creature develops rapid consciousness, I would say, throughout his, you know, to become sort of like a, a, a like a wolf coven, if you will, all the way through like this developed yeah. person. But thinking about the sort of embodied mind, uh, or, or, or contemporary philosophy and thinking about embodiment, he's gone through this trauma as well. So yeah. he goes through multiple traumas and thinking about how like a spark or his electricity like might have like shifted or, or, or phase shifted his, yeah. his mind. So when we think about what does it mean to not just be a separated consciousness, but yeah. to, be, to have to live in this body that's been created, the body is eight feet tall, it's made up of multiple parts. It's, yeah. it, it, how does that complicate his consciousness? Well, uh, one of the one of the scenes I think is really important is when, to me, it's when he becomes self-aware is when he's living uh, sort of behind the house of this uh, this peasant family, uh, and he number one he sees them communicating and begins to learn from them how to communicate, so he begins to learn language, but at the same time he also learns that he is causing their suffering by taking their food, so at the same time he learns consciousness and becomes self-aware, he becomes moral. He becomes, it seems to me, he develops a conscience. Uh, and that conscience begins to develop and grow throughout the, throughout the novel. So in that, in that early period, it's almost as though he's a big, angry child who doesn't understand why he's been abandoned and doesn't understand how to attribute blame or responsibility to his creator. But when he begins to see families and other people interacting in this social environment, he begins to understand the nature of language, he begins to understand his feelings and attitudes towards what's going on. I think that's really important. I think she's really trying to frame something there for us to think about. The nature of our interactions with other people, our sense of responsibility, and our sense of self, and how this develops over time in the novel. So, so what other topics within more philosophy would you say are, are evident or found in the novel? Uh, uh, well, you know, this is, so what's difficult, I think, and, and I don't want to discredit Mary Shelley. Uh, Mary Shelley was clearly, um, I think really probably it's right to call her a genius. Um, she, in a stroke of genius, she created not only, I mean, some people call Frankenstein the modern myth. Um, so she created this incredibly provocative image. But I don't think a lot of these issues were really clear to her. I think she was pondering them and wondering about them. So when you, when you ask that question, I, I think, well, was Mary Shelley herself being, quote, unquote, philosophical? I think she was posing philosophical issues. I don't know that she had a worked out philosophical point of view that she was trying to develop and articulate. I think a lot of what's in the novel is a reflection of her own you know, struggles with many of these issues. Uh, so from, from, from a philosopher's point of view, I'm kind of wondering what is the, what is the moral dilemma that she's working with. And, yeah. One of them is the relationship of the individual to society. The other one that I haven't really talked about is the relationship of the scientist to society, which is clearly the doppelganger to, to the, the monster. I mean, Victor is the classic uh, stereotype of the irresponsible mad scientist. Uh, so, and, and as the novel progresses, he be, seems to become more and more morally irresponsible. Uh, and reactionary, while well, the, the monster seems to become more and more sort of aware of the dynamics of this their situation. Um, so, you know, is Mary Shelley, you know, is she trying to, to uh, is she trying to tell us something? I, I really, I personally, I mean, I struggle. I'd be interested to know if people think or you know, people what you think. I think she's work wrestling with these issues of moral responsibility, um, the relationship of the, of the individual to society, the relationship of the scientist to an emerging um, field of science and a kind of new world that they're now occupying. Well, I would say from a literary perspective, I mean, Mary Shelley can be up and down in the same paragraph. Yeah. So people yeah. can go from the heights of, dis of contentment to the depths of despair all in a sentence. And so she is giving, I would say, the audience a little sort of uh, Playful nudge into knowing that there's no like one correct way to feel about anything, right? Uh, which is probably how she's thinking as a romantic in this time period. Yeah, and the other interesting thing here, uh, and I don't have 
a, a, a particular interpretation of this is uh, Percy Shelley's contributing to the writing. Uh, the last 11 pages he's written quite a bit of, apparently. And then there's this revision that she writes in 36, 1836, which is, in some sense, is a reaction against a lot of the public reaction to Frankenstein. The public felt like there was no, they, they wanted sort of an edifying moral tale with a clear punishment of bad, bad people and wrongdoing and some kind of vindication of the standard moral framework of the time. And I think it, you know, she sort of succumbed a little bit to that, to that uh, pressure. So there's this complication around which text. I, I prefer the 1818. We're here celebrating, and don't worry, in 2036, we'll be back again celebrating the second edition. Uh, so I, but I prefer the 1818 edition because it's, I think it's more direct, more straightforward, raw. There's problems with the text. There's some clear errors. There's some mistakes. I mean, just factual mistakes that she, she forgets or something, you know? So, um, but it's more direct and raw, and she's, I think, really expressing her real vision uh, at the time. She definitely um, put breath into this idea for, for every, you know, the monster extinguishes breath. And I thought that was a fascinating thing to bring up yeah. in terms of preservation <clears throat> and how that is the monster's sort of chosen way of uh, getting rid of everything. I bet if everybody remembers, everyone dies, and um, <laughs> the, the story ends unhappily for all. Um, that said, I want to thank you, Michael, so much thank for you. sharing you. Uh, your knowledge with us today and this great discussion. Um, coming up on uh, our future talks from Montshire um, Talks Frankenstein 200, we're going to dive deeply into the life world of Mary Shelley next week with a dramatic reading and discussion of a play called Fighting Frankenstein in Search of Mary Shelley, featuring Amanda Ray Hughes from Northern Stage. Montshire will then take a field trip the week after to Ron or Library to look at Frankenstein in both text and image. Um, it's a special program being held over on Dartmouth College campus. And then finally, we'll explore the ideas between Intelligence and Responsible Design with Eugene Santos, who's a professor at Thayer School of Engineering, and will think about artificial intelligence. Um, you can also visit us on the web at monshire.org to learn more about our programs. And our programming will be broadcast through our partner, CATV, if you want to see this again. So thank you so much for visiting the Monshire today, and we have a great evening today.